grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Savior Jesus. Amen. We turn our attention to today's Old Testament lesson where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and called him, where he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. This is God's word. Dear Christian friends, on this day, February 3rd, in the year A.D. 865, a man by the name of Anskar died. It's known as Saint Anskar, and this is his day, since this was the day he passed away. So who was this Saint Anskar? Strange name, I'm sure you think. Ansgar was a pastor 1,200 years ago in Germany who was given a commission to be a missionary to Christianize the barbarians to the north of Germany, many of whom we know as the Vikings. So Ansgar went to Denmark and he went to Sweden and he labored and finally established a very small congregation. He was brought back to Germany where he was made the Bishop of Hamburg, Germany, in northern Germany. And when he was serving in that role, the Danes, the Vikings, came down and ransacked and pillaged Hamburg and burned down all the Christian churches there. Ansgar had thoughts that someday he might die as a martyr, but no, he died a comfortable death, foiled again. And after his death, Scandinavia remained pagan for another 200 years before it was finally Christianized. Ansgar is best known today as the so-called patron saint of Denmark amongst Roman Catholics. I like to think of him as the patron saint of lost causes or the patron saint of missionaries who see little in terms of results. In fact, listen to the appointed collect prayer of the day for St. Ansgar's commemoration. We're going to use that in our pastor's conference service tomorrow night. Almighty and everlasting God, who sent your servant Anskar to sow the seeds of faith among the people of Scandinavia, keep your church from discouragement in the day of small success, knowing that when you have begun a good work, you will bring it to a fruitful conclusion. Well, I, and chances are many of us, can relate a little bit to Ansgar's experience and the smallness of success referred to in that prayer. And so too could the prophet Jeremiah. Outwardly speaking, Jeremiah was a failure. But he was hardly a failure. He certainly was not a failure before God who sent him on his mission. Today's text is the call to tear down and to build up that was given to Jeremiah by God himself. As Jeremiah wrote, the word of the Lord came to me before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Now, of course, God sees in advance the life that each of us will live before he even begins knitting us together in our mother's womb. God knows what we're going to be when we grow up. Now, he doesn't 
foreordain you to be a farmer or an engineer. He lets you make that choice. But he did foreordain Jeremiah to be a prophet. And he does know in advance who is going to be the pastor of a church before it ever comes about. In fact, he does more than know. He chooses and then he calls. God does not call by internal stirrings or feelings. He comes right out and calls with words as he did with Jeremiah. I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And he called each of the Old Testament prophets in exactly the same way. The word of the Lord came to them audibly. When Jesus was on earth, he personally, verbally called his apostles. He did so by speaking to them. He did not do it, again, by internal stirrings. He did it with words. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you, just as the Father has sent me, I am sending also you. But then, after Jesus ascended into heaven, we read in the book of Acts and in the pastoral epistles that Jesus continued to send out pastors, like Peter says, watch over the flock over whom the Lord has made you overseers. But now he did it through the church. For example, Paul told Pastor Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, train people to be pastors. And then he wrote to Pastor Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you, to ordain presbyters in every town. God still calls today, and he does so using words, not feelings. We still use roughly the same process as the early church. And the church does well to take that call process seriously and not manipulate it if it wants God's blessing. Jeremiah found his call from God to be intimidating. But I said, ah, Lord God, I really do not know how to speak. I am only a child. And he was certainly not the first one to be intimidated by a call from God. Moses protested by saying roughly the same thing many times as the Lord was calling him from the burning bush. He objected so much that the Lord became angry with him. What made Moses object? It's interesting, you know. When Moses was 40 years old, he tried to make himself leader of the children of Israel in Egypt. It resulted in murder and flight and 40 years in Moab as a shepherd. And now, when Moses is less brash, when Moses is humble, that's when the Lord actually calls him to become the leader of Israel. Jeremiah is afraid, and he has reason to be, because he lived in a time when most rejected their own God in Judah. But the Lord gives him reassurance and a promise. Do not be afraid of them, because I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. When I was young and being encouraged to enter the ministry, everybody I knew thought of the pastoral ministry as, as an honorable job. Well, that's less and less true today with each passing year. But I guess you could say things have returned to normal 
if that's what we could call the life and times of people like Jeremiah or Moses or Ansgar. As a matter of fact, at the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther advised his son Hans to not study for the ministry. He told Hans, you should become a doctor. You, you, you just don't have the disposition to handle all of the trash talk you would get. Of course, Luther was able to handle that. But it is God who calls, whether directly in the case of prophets and apostles, or indirectly through the church in the case of pastors, ever since Bible days. And God still makes the same promises to be with those who go out in his name and to rescue them from those who might oppose them. And since it is God who calls those who preach the word, it is also God who gets to decide what preachers preach. To Jeremiah, he said, you must go to everyone to whom I send you and say whatever I command you. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, there, I have now placed my words into your mouth. Doesn't sound so complicated until you think of the message of God in all its fullness. Did you notice what happened when Jesus preached in his hometown of Nazareth? Jesus read the text, sat down on the, the seat at the front of the synagogue to expound on the text, began to do so, did so briefly, and then they all spoke well of him and were impressed by the words of grace that came from his mouth. In our day and age, preachers read the text, although not everybody does that anymore, and then expounds on it, and then people speak well of the preacher and greet him after the service, shake his hand and say, that was a really wonderful sermon, pastor, and everybody's happy. The preacher's happy, the congregation is happy, the visitors are happy, everybody's happy. Happens every week with Joel Osteen. On average, 52,000 people attend his Lakewood Church in Houston in the building that was an arena, a basketball arena that he bought from the city of Houston. And another 7 million happily watch his sermons each week. And so everybody was happy with Jesus' sermon. Except Jesus... So he went on preaching. He told them, certainly you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown everything we heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, amen, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But truly, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the day of Elijah, when the sky was shut for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land, Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow of Zarephath in Sidon, up in Lebanon, a foreigner. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was healed, except Naaman the foreigner, the Syrian. Was the congregation still happy? Not so much. All those who were in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things. They got up and drove him out of the town. They led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Jesus did exactly what God had told Jeremiah to do 600 years earlier. He preached the word 
that God placed in his mouth. He preached whatever God commanded him to say. St. Paul once gave this command to New Testament pastors. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For there will come a time when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, because they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in line with their own desires. They will also turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. As for you, keep a clear head in every situation, bear hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The pastor is not to add to God's word in order to make it palatable. It is not his job to subtract from God's word anything he thinks might be too difficult or too unpopular. The pastor is not to be a people pleaser. Rather, he is to say whatever I command you, as God told Jeremiah. He is to study the word so he knows what it says, and then he is to communicate God's word. All of it. Look, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Judah needed to hear the judgment that was coming on them. Jeremiah's preaching was to tear down their idols, destroy their pride. He was to uproot their self-righteousness and overthrow their false beliefs, precisely as Jesus sought to do in his own hometown synagogue. Judah needed to be called to repentance. So did Nazareth 600 years later. So did the Vikings in the 800s. And in 2019, the task of preaching is still to call to repentance, not just to the unbelievers on the outside, but to all of us. We have each individually sinned and fallen short of the glory of God this week, many times, just as we did last week. We have failed to devote ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We have failed to take his word fully to heart and put it into practice and let it change us from the inside out. And because God loves us, he wants us to hear that and know that and repent. And that is so he can build up and plant. You can't sow seed on rock and concrete. Rock has to be crushed. Concrete needs to be ground up because God wants new life to sprout. He wants his true church to grow. He wants believers to turn to him and cry for mercy. He wants people to give up on themselves and rely on him alone for salvation and for every blessing. The message of forgiveness is the only thing that can cause growth and renewal. But the law needs to plow the field so it can be planted. And that twin task of tearing down and building, of uprooting and planting, requires special discernment. It's known as rightly dividing the word of truth, as St. Paul wrote to Pastor Timothy. And in our circles, we call it rightly dividing law and gospel. There are times to tear down 
and times to build up. And the preacher must know the difference. As the old saying goes, the job of a preacher is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. You saw how the people of Nazareth were ready to give Jesus cheap compliments at first. He knew he needed to afflict the comfortable. He could see they needed to be torn down. And we can see it too by their decision to try to throw him off a cliff. Jeremiah likewise was persecuted. But he remained faithful in comforting the afflicted, his small flock. And afflicting the comfortable. The king, the priests, the Levites, the vast majority of the people of Judah. He did so by faithfully preaching law and gospel. It's a blessing in our churches that pastors and congregations are generally on the same page. But conflicts like that have been known to happen. It remains the assignment from God of every pastor to faithfully preach only what God says and to apply it correctly to proclaim judgment and call the comfortable to repentance and to comfort those whose souls have been properly humbled by the word it's the job of every hearer to let God's word make them uncomfortable when it should and then to find true comfort in the right place in the forgiveness offered by Jesus. Thank God for the ministry of the word. Thank God that he still calls and sends pastors to his people through the church. Take God's word to heart. Treasure it and pray that the Lord of the harvest would continue to send forth preachers, for the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Amen.